Hello, everyone. Good to see you again today. Hope you had a great week. So today we have a great speaker. Uh, I'm really excited to welcome Lena Vincent. Uh, Lena is based out of Los Angeles. As you could guess, she's at NASA and NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. And not only is she with the Jet Propulsion Lab, but she's also a fantastic science communicator. Uh, she is an experimental astrobiologist, and she's studying how signs of life might be preserved on worlds uh, such as Europa and others. And she calls herself the jack of all trades because she's combining many of her approaches and knowledge from analytical chemistry, astronomy, biology, geology, planetary science, and many other disciplines. So we're really excited not only to meet Lena today, but also to get a glimpse of what she does and what her day-to-day -day looks like. And that means seeing an awesome lab tour, uh, getting an awesome lab tour and seeing how a lab works. Um, before we kick off though, just some housekeeping items for each of you. Um, as you come in here, give me a second. All right. Yeah, somehow seeping items, sorry, I can't share my screen, but uh, Canvas, all of Canvas is up to date. There we go. So keep your Canvas up to date. We have extended the quiz deadlines. So um, yeah, we have extended the quiz deadlines for Dr. Williams' talk. So that's now due Sunday, August 27th. Uh, for the team's information, uh, if you submitted a team, but if there are changes in your team, if there are any modifications, there's a whole process you can go through it. That's on Canvas as well. Uh, and then our mission checkpoint. So I hope all of you are preparing and ready for it. And that will be on September 1st. And consequently, we'll give you feedback on the same. And lastly, we want to learn about you. I know many of you are doing amazing work in space, on satellites, on, on various different like geology projects as well. So do sign up. The Flash Talks, you can sign up on Canvas and our Flash Talks will resume. Uh, next Tuesday. So very excited to have you um, have you all here. And of course, very excited to have Dr. Lina here as well. So, all right, now let's get on and see what her lab looks like. A very, very quick Hi, my name is Lena Vincent. I'm an astrobiologist and NASA postdoc fellow here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I'm super excited to show you around the different lab spaces I work in to carry out my experiments. But before I show you all of that, I just wanna give you a very, very quick overview of what it is I do exactly. So I am very interested in this question of whether or not life exists elsewhere in the solar system beyond Earth. And in particular, in the outer solar system on very special moons that we think have large bodies of water, so oceans and icy surfaces. Now, in a few decades, hopefully sooner than that, uh, we may get the chance to send spacecraft to these moons. And the two in particular that we're really interested in are Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter's, and Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn, and explore these worlds and search for signs of life there. But the big question is what exactly we should look for. Uh, we know that these environments are very, very harsh, and we're not necessarily sure how the chemistry and the molecules of life will behave under those conditions. And that is exactly what we're trying to figure out in this lab. So we're actually equipped to recreate some of the conditions that we expect to find on Enceladus and Europa, and we can stick things like microbes, um, different molecules of life, to test how they will behave and respond to these conditions so that we have some idea of what we might find when we finally do go explore these worlds. And now let's go take a look at our lab spaces. So this is the first lab space I'm going to show you. This is our biology lab. This is where we prepare all of our biological samples that we're going to expose to the conditions that we think are representative of these icy worlds. Let's start in this fridge here, which is where we store some of those biological samples. Uh, so let's take a look in here. And actually a lot of the microbes I'm working with right now live in these racks. So the microbe I'm working with right now is called Bacillus subtilis. And it creates these really interesting spores, which are very, very, very hardy cells. So they're a really good model to run our experiments with. And when I work with those spores, I have to be really, really careful that everything is super clean so that I don't introduce any other microbes that I'm not interested in. And the main way I do that is by working in this thing here, which is called a biosafety cabinet. Um, and it opens up, the door opens up and I can stick my hands in there and it's all very clean and sterile in there. So it's, it's a good way for me to prevent any kind of contamination. 
Now, just across from the biosafety cabinet, there's some bench space here, and you'll see a lot of chemicals on these shelves. And I use most of these chemicals to make the media or the food that these bee subspores actually need to eat and grow. Now, over here on this bench is where I prepare the bee subspores to actually get loaded up into the chambers that I'm going to show you upstairs that allow us to recreate those conditions that we're interested in. Um, so we have some vacuum systems here, uh, some pipette tips and pipetters, a lot of different solutions that I need to get my work done. Now, if we look over here, um, you'll see these kind of stainless steel tabs. And on those tabs, they kind of look kind of dirty, right? Those are actually bee sub spores sitting on there. These are old tabs that I just use in an experiment that I need to clean. Um, but these tabs are actually what allow me to put them in the chamber, uh, which we're about to go look at actually. Before we do that though, I just wanna show you a couple more things in this lab. So uh, we have more fridges and then we have the opposite of fridges. Uh, this right here is called an incubator. It allows me to store samples at a particular temperature and bee sub actually likes to grow at 37 degrees, which is kind of warm. Um, so that's basically a little warmer. Uh, we also have other incubators that allow us to shake samples. And this right here is really important. This is called an autoclave. This allows me to sterilize all of the equipment that I'm working with, again, just to make sure everything's very clean and we're not introducing any contamination. Okay, now let's head upstairs to our other lab space, which is where that irradiation chamber lives. All right, we are switching to a voiceover because it is extremely loud in this lab and you would not be able to hear me. But this is what's called the Planetary Science Laboratory Studies Lab. And you can see there's a lot going on in here. And we basically have a number of different vacuum chambers that recreate different environments in the solar system. And this is the one we're gonna look at. This is the chamber that I work with. So this metal thing here, that's the chamber itself. And it's hooked up to a whole bunch of pumps, which allow me to remove any gas in there. And that's really important because we know that these moons have no atmosphere. And the other really cool thing about this chamber is that it has a number of different radiation sources hooked up to them. And the one we're looking at right now is a UV lamp. Uh, so this is to try to recreate the conditions at the surface of these moons, which don't have an atmosphere and have a lot of UV, which you can kind of see in there, the UV lamp is on. And here's a closer look. So remember those stainless steel tabs? You can actually see a layer of spores on there and they're illuminated by this very strong UV light. This here is a different radiation source. This is actually an electron gun, which is a different source of radiation. And this blue thing underneath of it, this is called a cryostat. And this allows us to make the chamber super, super cold because the surfaces of these moons is very cold. And here I have the chamber at 100 Kelvin, uh, which is extremely cold, far colder than any human could survive. Um, but that's a really important aspect as we wanna try to understand how the molecules behave at these temperatures. So that is the chamber. All right, so now you've seen what the lab spaces that I do most of my work in look like. Uh, now you can watch two demo videos that I've created. Uh, one walks you through how I set up that really cool lamp I just showed you that's attached to the chamber that allows me to expose my spores to sunlight UV. And the other is super cool. It's using a really cool type of microscope over at Caltech called a scanning electron microscope that allows me to get really, really close up images of the spores to see how they've changed when they've been exposed to the radiation. Uh, so go ahead and watch those. Let's set up a xenon arc lamp, which is a super cool kind of lamp that produces sun-like UV. Now ours is enclosed in the special housing, and first thing I gotta do is put on the fans because this thing gets super hot when it's on. Then I'm connecting this duct that goes to an ozone scrubber because UV and oxygen make ozone, which is really bad. Then I'm connecting the electrodes and all the cables that run from the power supply that ignites the lamp to the actual lamp housing. Then I made this fancy tube, which is going to enclose the beam from the lamp to the chamber itself to protect my eyes. And then I went to plug it in, realized I couldn't because this is a three prong plug when all of my lab's outlets are four pronged. So yeah, had to rewire it, which is fine. Then I realized I was supposed to put this part on first. So I had to take it apart do it all over again, and yeah, just about done with that until I realized that there are actually two different kinds of four-pronged plugs, and I used the wrong one. So, you know, it's okay, learning on the job, it's all right. So I went to work on putting on the correct four-pronged plug, and I think now we're good to go. I can actually plug it in and try to power the lamp on, and let's hope it works. So first I gotta put on my safety glasses to protect my eyes, and now, will it work? Will it work? 
yep, it works. There is light, so yep, it's very bright. There is basically a mini sun's worth of UV in there, uh, which is very exciting, and now I can actually use it in my experiments. Today we're going to be using this very powerful, very fancy microscope to take super close-up images of some of my samples. First though, I need to cover them in platinum, yes, platinum, so here I'm sticking my samples in this sputter coater, which literally uses plasma to deposit a thin layer of platinum on my samples. There you go, you can't really tell the difference, but I promise you it's there. Then I gotta put them on this little stage with some double-sided carbon tape that's gonna secure my little tabs, and then I'm gonna bring them over to the microscope to actually load them up. This is a special kind of microscope called an electron microscope, which means it uses electrons instead of light to generate images of the material you're looking at. Now I'm just hopping over to the computer that actually controls the microscope and confirming that my samples are there, and now I'm turning on the electron beam, and we are working with about 15,000 kilovolts today, and this is probably my favorite part of the whole thing, is this little joystick. Um, then I have to actually control the brightness and the contrast so I can see my image clearly, and that's actually starting to look like something now. A bit more fine-tuning, and by the way, what we're looking at today are bacterial spores, and there they are. The other cool thing about this setup is it's hooked up to an elemental analyzer, which actually allows me to point and click on an image and tell me exactly what that area is made of elementally, which is super cool. And oh, these are so cute. Twins! Once I'm finished and I'm happy with all the images I have, it's time to unload my samples, shut off the microscope, and say goodbye for the day. Awesome. So I'm sure many of you have questions. Please add them on Discord. I'll be monitoring them. And as we get started, maybe some initial questions for Lena are, Lena, how did you select which lab instruments to use for, for your scientific goals? Yeah. yeah, so there are a lot available to us, um, but and it sort of depends at what stage in the process we're talking about. Obviously, I use a lot of instruments to prepare my samples and also expose them to radiation, which is what I showed. In those videos, something I didn't show was the analysis that happens on the other end. So once we want to understand how these conditions are affecting the spores or other things, um, it could be other types of cells, it could be biological materials, uh, we want to know how those have changed, how they've been affected by the various conditions. So we do a lot of uh, chemical analysis downstream of that. Uh, the way that we select those instruments is actually a little bit more controlled. Um, obviously, we want to do this science in preparation for upcoming space flight missions, which means we have some restrictions, right? So we can't send any old instrument we want up there. Um, things have to be neatly packaged. Um, they have to occupy a pretty small space. Um, they have to be pretty foolproof, right? We don't can't send humans there to potentially fix some of these instruments if they break. Uh, so we want to make sure that they're pretty robust. Um, but that they do the actual job that we want to do. So that's another big aspect of how we pick these instruments is what exactly are we trying to detect? Um, how much of the thing we're trying to detect? So all these things come into play, but there's this big overlying uh, constraint of it has to be able to fly into space. So that's that's how we make those decisions. Right. Oh, that's very interesting. And then how does the lab work? Um, or how do you use lab work to interface with existing spacecraft data and any upcoming missions? So that's a good question. So um, obviously it depends who you talk to at JPL has uh, you know, varying amounts of connection to upcoming spaceflight missions. So I would describe the work as I do as, as very, very early on in the process. So we're basically doing basic science uh, that's not necessarily tied to an, ex an existing mission or even a planned mission at this point. Uh, so I personally don't do a ton of work uh, with mission-based uh, uh, applications. Uh, so my work is really trying to inform uh, just at the very high level, what is it that we want to be ultimately looking for when we want to search for life? And that will hopefully help inform future spacecraft designs and future missions to try to look for life elsewhere, because really the science is, is not there yet. We really don't have a good grasp on what it is exactly that is a conclusive signature, no matter what, um, of life in these foreign environments. And so... Um, I do get to interact with a lot of people who work on specific missions, especially upcoming ones like Europa Clipper. Uh, this is a spacecraft that will go into orbit around Jupiter and will do close flybys of one of those moons I was talking about, Europa, which is really interesting. Uh, that is expected to launch next year and it will take a few years to get there. So um, it will go into orbit around Jupiter in 2030. 
And so we'll start getting our first data then. So I work pretty closely with people who um, work on that mission and other ones as well, but at least in terms of how my work relates, um, it's, at this point, it's not direct uh, with any mission. Okay, that's very interesting. And then coming back to the instruments again, uh, does the, uh, is that the instrumentation setup or the lab setup, does that differ based on where you're going? Yeah, it does actually. So um, I didn't show some of the other chambers just because I don't know them quite as well. I don't work with them, but we have a chamber in there right now that simulates the surface of Pluto, uh, which is uh, a, not a planet, but a, uh, a planetary body in our solar system. Um, that has its own uh, temperature conditions, its own pressure conditions, uh, radiation as well, because uh, even though it's really far out in the solar system, it does still get affected by um, the different kinds of radiation that exists in our solar system, both from the sun and other. Uh, so we have Pluto in there, um, but yes, yeah, so all of our chambers are really cool. They all have slight different modifications that will allow us to explore little changes in conditions um, that we think are representative of other planetary bodies. So it does definitely change and we have the capacity to do that. Right. Wow. Very interesting. And then what are some, well, I have some more questions. What are the most important factors to consider in a lab analog environment? Yeah, well, I think just a, a very general uh, consideration um, that we always have to be aware of, no matter what kind of analog work we're trying to do, is that our systems are gonna be imperfect representations of the worlds we're trying to explore. So to always uh, think about that, right? Always um, in two ways, kind of one is to sort of kind of let go of that need to have it be a perfect representation because it's never going to be a perfect representation. So it does take the pressure off just a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes when you're trying to design an experiment, you wanna be really careful to include everything. It can kind of make it impossible, right? Like you get overwhelmed by the fact that you can't get it to be a perfect simulant of your analog environment. Um, and But then the other thing is in interpreting results and making conclusions. It's always being very, very careful to remember that what we're finding in a laboratory, while it may be a good approximation, it might give us a good idea of what we can expect to find and how those things will influence the processes we're studying, um, that they may not be representative of what it is we're actually trying to study. So um, that's one general consideration and then the other thing is thinking carefully about what it is exactly we are trying to simulate in that analog environment. So obviously in those vacuum chambers I showed you, um, they're very sophisticated, but they only allow us to replicate certain conditions. And the ones that we're interested in primarily are temperature uh, vacuum, right? So the fact that there's no atmosphere on these worlds and getting rid of our own atmosphere so it doesn't interfere. Uh, and then the radiation. But there are also other aspects, right? That are really important on these worlds, um, how salty they are. Uh, how much sunlight they're getting, things like that. And those we're not necessarily super interested in simulating right now. Um, so yeah, so those are just some general considerations of the analog work. Right. Well, a lot of good considerations. Um, how do you choose a species of microorganisms to work with? Yeah, that's a good question. So as I mentioned in the video, what we're using are Bacillus subtilis or B sub, as I abbreviated it to in the video, B sub spore. So B Bacillus subtilis is a a bacterium, it's very cool because it has a second type of cell structure it can form called a spore. So, you know, happy Bacillus subtilis kind of looks like a normal cell when it's doing well, but then when conditions get a little bit harsh, it has the ability to sporulate um, and basically become a very, very hardy version of itself. Um, and so it has a number of mechanisms it goes through to, to gain these adaptations. Um, so it, you know, it, it absorbs minerals from the environment and it uses that to kind of calcify its out, outside. So it becomes a very, very hard spore, a hard cell. Um, we call that a spore coat. And then has a number of other adaptations to its, its DNA uh, repair mechanisms are very strong. So if it happens to get damaged by DNA, uh, by DNA ionizing radiation, um, it can fix that pretty quickly. So we pick that because um, B-sub is very hardy. It's very easy to grow. Um, it's not dangerous. It's not a human pathogen. So we don't have to go through any um, specialized procedures or uh, to mitigate any risk associated with working with them. Um, but it's also been extensively studied in the context of space exploration because it has these adaptations. Um, so, you know, people want to understand how uh, life on Earth might persist on spacecraft even after they've been sterilized. Um, B sub is often used as that standard. You know, if we can kill Bacillus subtilis, we know we can kill life pretty well when we're sterilizing things. Um, so that's why we used it. It's very well studied, easy to grow, um, and it's very hardy. 
right right so that's the standard for killing something all right. yes exactly <laughs> All right. So Nicole S. from Puerto Rico, are the organisms that have been used for previous and current experiments bacteria or um, so are these organisms? Oh, right. Are they bacteria or have there been uh, archaea? And I'm. Yeah. Yeah. So we um, all the experiments that we've done so far have been with Bacillus subtilis. So bacteria, we have another bacteria and we've played around with a little bit. Uh, we haven't put archaea in there. That's actually something I want to do. Uh, so uh, when I joined the lab, the proposal that I had that was funded was to actually put in other organisms that we think not only are hardy, but have uh, more specific adaptations for the kinds of environments we're studying. So not just high radiation, but also very cold. Um, so th that turns out that comes with a whole different set of adaptations. And so understanding how those might confer an advantage in a high radiation environment is something of great interest to us. Um, now, a lot of um, psychro-tolerant or cold-tolerant microbes happen to be the archaea. Uh, and so I've been very interested in um, putting some archaea in there. Uh, once we have a, a better uh, idea of how the bacillus subtilis spores are behaving and we have a good end-to-end -end procedure for how to carry out the experiments and analyze them, eventually we can stick whatever we want in there and use that same procedure. So no archaea yet, but hopefully soon. Fantastic. Um... So uh, Kayla asks, this is about your um, your SEM machine. So she asks, what scale are you working on, on the SEM? And then how large are the individual pores? Yeah, good question. So um, the, obviously what we're looking at is very, very, very small. And that is the appeal of using SEM is allow us to, to magnify objects much more than we can with traditional light microscopy. The electrons are very, very small. Uh, much smaller than light photons, which means we can get fi much finer grain detail um, and higher resolution. Um, so the scales that we're working on, so the, a lot of the images that you saw, the kind of more zoomed in ones, those tend to be about 5,000 to 8,000 times magnified uh, compared to what you can see with your eye. So pretty high. Um, and then the uh, spores, I believe they're about 100 microns across, so micrometers, so very, very, very tiny. Um, not the tiniest microbes that exist. We know that there are some that are much, much smaller. Um, but yeah, so that's a general sense of the scale that we're working with. Right. Oh, very interesting. Um, so Anna from Romania asks, and we have a lot of great students from, from Romania, especially from some of the space programs there. So Anna asks, how did you pick which bacteria, spores, materials you investigate? I think you answered that, but maybe there's some more nuance there. Yeah. Yes. Yep. It's a, the same answer, right? So the, there was just a lot of good reasons. It's a very good model organism for the type, the thing that we like to do. That's something that comes up in biology a lot is having a good model organism that kind of checks all the boxes that makes things experimentally a little bit easier than they would be if you were to use a microbe that's not as well studied. Um, so right. yeah, so that's, that's the reason we use it. Okay, great. Yes. And for those of you with questions, please keep adding your questions to Discord. I'm monitoring all of them. Um, so this is a question from Raj, one of the co-founders of Verminium. How cool is a cryostat? And I showed you, we had a quantum program before this. We go pretty cool in quantum. So how cool is the cryostat? Uh, and then, uh, yeah, uh, why don't we start there? Yeah, so our cryostat actually allows us to go down to 10 Kelvin. That's very, very cold, right? So, um, you know, a lot of the experiments I'm doing at about 100 Kelvin, just because we think that's a, a good average temperature to be representative of these distant outer solar system objects, which are extremely, extremely cold. Um, going down to, actually, I believe our press that might go on, down to one Kelvin. Uh, so just for reference, Kelvin, um, zero Kelvin is absolute zero. Uh, that is the coldest temperature you can achieve. That is when all of the material, all of the atoms inside a, a, a material are completely immobile. There's absolutely no heat whatsoever. Uh, that is a very difficult temperature to achieve. The closest we can get to is one Kelvin. That is way overkill for our experiments. We don't need to go that cold. Right. Um, so we've done experiments, I think, at 10 Kelvin. I've been working exclusively at 100. Uh, just for reference, that's negative 173 degrees Celsius. That is very, very cold. <laughs> Even though it's warmer than one Kelvin, um, it's still yes. extremely cold. Um, yes. So that's how cold our cryostat can go. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's very interesting. And if you want to know what gets colder than the cryostats, yeah. the quantum program, so some of the dilution refrigerators, they go to four, four millikelvin. So that's how cold, cold they're getting and colder than space, of course. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we have uh, Agatha from the UK, and her question is, is uh, are some of these experiments also useful for Earth-based exploration and analysis? And some examples she has are like deep sea missions, you know, which might be similar to the icy ones. I see yes, one. absolutely. Yes. And our laboratory um, does actually work with a number of other collaborators that are more interested in Earth applications. Uh, so as you might imagine, you know, just trying to understand how molecules fare in extreme environments and then what kinds of analytical tools we can use to detect um, responses to those conditions is very useful uh, in any place where there is a liquid. Um, so that is what we specialize in is is studying these things in liquids. Uh, and so a lot of the analytical pipelines that we have are, are optimized for that. Um, and so there's applications, you know, with wastewater monitoring, uh, ecology, right, doing, uh, coupling that with ecology. So, you know, you say you find a lake somewhere and you want to understand how that lake is fluctuating uh, in terms of the organic matter that's available or some of the non-organic things too, how salty it is, how its pH is changing. Um, a lot of the technologies that our lab is developing are useful for that as well. Right. Um, and then also not quite as far as the outer solar system, but a little bit farther from Earth as uh, things like the International Space Station or uh, in, in environments where humans and other uh, living things are exposed to high radiation. So, you know, it turns out as soon as you escape most of the atmosphere of, of the Earth, you, you get exposed to very high doses of radiation. Uh, kind of understanding how that affects the body is super important. So yeah, so all kinds of applications, both right here at home and just kind of extending out in the solar system. Yeah, yeah fantastic. And then one thing I want to touch on, which you mentioned, is the applications, especially for lakes and wastewater, et cetera. Can you talk a bit more of the the kind of tech to market or this knowledge sharing between industries, how that happens as well? And have you been a part of that? What, what are successes you see there? Yeah, so... Um, so I, ha I don't have a ton of experience with that. So, you know, I, before I joined NASA, I was in academia. I was at a university where I did my PhD, which I would say is a very different landscape um, than working in a government agency. Um, and uh, the, so the procedures are a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit harder to do that knowledge transfer, I would say, um, here at NASA and just in, in general, working in government agencies, working with technology, um, you know, especially things like propulsion technology, rocket technology, all of that is very, very protected. And there's a, a very specific process for disseminating that information. Um, even basic science information uh, is strictly regulated. So for example, the video I showed today, I actually had to submit uh, to JPL. They have an internal review system just to make sure that I'm not sharing anything that uh, is a secret uh, or that they don't want shared necessarily using this platform. Uh, so that, as you might imagine, makes knowledge sharing just slightly more difficult. Obviously, we're very open to collaborating. Uh, you know, we, we know that science is a collaborative effort and it doesn't exist in a vacuum and it, it is made stronger uh, by knowledge sharing, right? And doing that openly. So there are definitely ways we can do that. Um, there are grant mechanisms within JPL and NASA that allow us to work with different things. NASA's work with DARPA quite a bit. Um, it works with um, things like Chevron, uh, so that knowledge transfer does exist, but it is, you know, for those who come from an academic background, it is a little bit of a different landscape. I think something for all of you to think about is like, how do you take these amazing applications, basic science and apply it to different fields and how to go about that? Because like you said, you know, knowledge is, is meant to be shared and that, you know, supports all of society, especially some of the cutting work that NASA has done, has come down into the civilian space and, and made tremendous impact. Um, do you ever use a microphobe in your research? So this is again, Kayla from the US. Do you ever use a microphobe in your research? A micro, um, do you mean a micro probe? Is that the word? Oh, yeah, micro probe, yes, a micro Okay, a micro probe. I have not, so in my particular research here, I don't use a micro probe and I actually don't know, I, I, I would imagine somebody at JPL has a micro, micro probe. Um, I have not used it. I did use a micro probe in my PhD work, which is a little bit different, um, studying how, um, molecules interacted with the surfaces of minerals. And so microprobe is a really good way to do that. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know if we have any at JPL and I currently don't use one, but they are very cool um, and I have used them in the past. Great. All right, so Ayush Thakur from Nepal asks, what are the organisms out there are not carbon life? So, you know, what type of preparation do we have for it? Okay, uh, preparation. Okay, so do you mean, uh, you know, can non-carbon based life forms exist and then would we be yeah. equipped to handle those at all is that right exactly exactly and to detect them at all yeah yes yeah. yeah. so 
to, uh, to date, no. Um, no, we have not discovered any evidence of non-carbon based life existing or even being possible. Um, you may have heard that there are some ideas about, um, you know, elements that are similar to carbon potentially acting in the way carbon does things like silicon. Mm -hmm. And that is a really interesting thing to explore conceptually. Uh, we don't know if that's possible. There are a lot of reasons to think silicon might not be the best for life, especially if that life depends on water the way, the way to, uh, our life depends on water. So silicon turns out is not very versatile in water at all. It tends to oxidize and then form these silicate minerals. And then once they're in that mineral form, it's hard to do anything with them. That's not very good for life, right? We know life's chemistry is very dynamic. It relies on breaking and forming new bonds and forming these kind of large scale structures like DNA, proteins, all that stuff. Silicon doesn't do that very well. But there are some people who have thought about if silicon life did exist, where would it do that? What kinds of conditions would they need? Uh, and so, so there, there's some thinking about that, you know, like they would need very acidic environments. There would need to be no oxygen whatsoever. It would need to be very cold, things like that. So we've thought about it in principle, it seems possible with very stringent conditions. We have not found any evidence of silicon based life. Uh, and I should mention that some organisms on Earth do use silica. So you may have heard of diatoms. Um, these are little uh, oceanic uh, marine creatures. They're, they're phytoplankton, they're photosynthetic, they're microscopic. Uh, their shells are made of silica, but it's important to note that their chemistry is still based on carbon. So all their metabolism, all their uh, cellular structure is carbon. Uh, now, are we prepared to deal with silicon-based life? No. <laughs> Not at all. In fact, you know, the majority of life on Earth, we cannot study in a lab. We cannot handle, uh, you know, the vast majority of the diversity of life on Earth is microbial. Uh, most microbes we cannot culture. And those are all carbon-based. So you can imagine we have a hard time culturing even carbon-based organisms. Imagine silicon-based organisms. So, um, you know, again, we don't know for sure because we've never encountered it, but I would venture to say that probably not. Right. Right. That's a very interesting and informative answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I, also you mentioned uh, diatom and I've seen great art from diatom. So for everyone here, I recommend check out diatoms. Yeah, yeah they're beautiful. I highly recommend yes. looking at them. A lot of the images you'll see are scanning electron micrographs. So nice. the same uh, kind of tool that I showed you. Um, there are also light micro. They're a little bit bigger, so you can use them under light microscopy. But I recommend looking at photos of both. They're, they're very pretty. <laughs> right. Indeed. All right, so we have, um, yeah, now now we get a little bit into some of the work you're doing and into your journey, Lena. So I have Elena from Canada who asks, have you considered looking at other facets of uh, astrobiology for your research or education? So exoplanets, atmospheric analysis. Yeah, so um, I did my PhD in a slightly different branch of astrobiology. I was more interested in understanding the origin of life. So how... The chemistry of life arose um, not just on planet Earth, but in general, how you get life from non-life. Um, so that was a, a very different branch. The origin of life field within astrobiology is pretty big. Um, of course, there's still a lot of uncertainty, um, but there are a lot of really interesting questions to answer in that field. Um, so now I've moved over a little bit more to what we call life detection and biosignatures astrobiology. So you know, if life does exist elsewhere, how do we find it? That's the main question guiding my research now. Um, I haven't necessarily thought about uh, doing research beyond that, uh, say, with exoplanets. So I do find exoplanets very interesting. However, I'm an experimentalist. Uh, mm -hmm. I really, you know, the way that I do my science and kind of uh, reason is in a lab. Uh, that's where I work best. Um, that, you know, taking things apart, actually manipulating them, um, that, that's very important for me, for my understanding, and that's kind of how I make sense of stuff. Uh, that's very hard to do in the context of exoplanets, for example, uh, where, you know, all we have are these very remote detections, right? These things are light years away. Um, so there's really no feasible way for us to, like, go and do something with that, or even to learn enough about them that we can do some kind of simulation in a laboratory. So I haven't thought about that. I do find exoplanets absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I keep up with the news with that, especially with our new flagship telescope, JWST, which has doing, be, been doing amazing work in that realm and in astronomy in general. Um, but yeah, so, and I don't know what I will do next. We know what my post postdoc work will entail, um, but I'm open to all branches of astrobiology. I think it's all super interesting. Indeed, indeed. And you mentioned the James Webb Space Telescope. One of Womenium's earlier programs was indeed working with NASA and we uh, trained about 30, yeah, about 30 young women 
from uh, undergrad to master's to go and work at Goddard Space Center when it was at when the James O was at Goddard for its testing. So very cool, very exciting work. Um, yeah, and then tell us about you. You know, my introduction to you was very, very brief, but tell us about your journey. So Daniela from Costa Rica also asks, how did you start in the space field? And you started from biology, you got into space. Um, and then from there, you know, what is what is some advice you would give to young women starting in their STEM careers? Yeah, so I have a, had a little bit of a nonlinear path, I think, as most scientists have. Uh, so I started, uh, I entered into science as an undergrad Um but before that, I didn't really know that I could be a scientist necessarily. So I science was something I struggled with in middle school and in high school. Uh, math was always very challenging for me. Um, so I, I sort of never pictured that science might be a viable career for me. Uh, but I had the opportunity kind of sort of randomly to uh, work at an aquarium in Chicago, which is where I was living at the time, the Shedd Aquarium. Highly recommend going. If uh, you haven't before, it's, it's a lovely aquarium. They do a lot of conservation and outreach work. And as part of that work, uh, they have programs for uh, young students to come and learn about marine biology, but also do research. So I was very lucky. I got to actually go to the Bahamas for a summer and work, spend time on the research vessel, carry out little experiments. Um, and that, that I sort of fell in love with the field. I decided I wanted to be a marine biologist. And so I started um, pursuing undergrad programs in marine biology. That brought me to Cal State Long Beach, which is where I got my undergrad. I eventually switched over to general biology because I realized I just liked biology in general and I wanted to keep my options open beyond marine biology. Uh, that's also where I joined my first research lab. Uh, at the time I was doing much more classical biology. So studying genetics, uh, molecular biology of a fungus. That was my first research progress for, um, experience. Uh, and then, yeah, from there I took a couple of different projects, uh, some in biomedical science, stem cell biology, cancer biology until I ultimately discovered that astrobiology was a thing. And I sort of adjusted my career to, to start doing astrobiology, uh, primarily through my PhD at first, uh, and then now uh, at NASA as a postdoc fellow. So that's sort of how I entered um, a lot of shifting interests. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to, you know, capitalize on those changes and, and, and do something with it. And I think that's a big piece of advice for me for for people in general, especially for young women is you know, recognizing that interests change. Uh, and that can be a little bit scary sometimes, you know, when you dedicate a significant portion of your life to studying a very specific thing, it can feel scary to put that to the side and say, I want to study something else now. Um, this is what interests me. Um, but it's also really fun. I think that's what makes science so great is, you know, once you understand the scientific process and um, you kind of have a general sense of what it means to do a scientific investigation, you can kind of apply that anywhere. Uh, and you can get that the knowledge that you need to think critically about a field by yourself. Like that's kind of what you you become an expert in doing uh, by virtue of of going through scientific training. Uh, so you know if you have the opportunity to explore a new interest, for me personally, it's worked out really well. Um, and I think in general, it works out pretty well. You know, but but so you know just just remembering that interest change and it's totally okay to change fields completely. Um, even though it can, can feel scary, you know, there's more to life than expertise. Um, right. And uh, right. yeah, there you go. <laughs> and of course, you know, there's scientific curiosity and discovery, which is rewarding in it by itself. And right. what I found in my career, sometimes the dots connect, even though they don't connect looking forward, looking back, they do. Everything helps. Yep. Um, one thing you've been fantastic at is, you know, through Instagram, TikTok, et cetera, you've also been talking about the work you do. Tell us a bit of that journey, like what inspired you to talk about it? And then how, how is it working today? Uh, yeah. yeah. So um, I, so I've always really been interested in science communication um, in grad school. I did a lot of it. I took, you know, tried to jump on opportunities as much as I could, but I would say they were in much more traditional settings. So, you know, speaking at schools, speaking at retirement homes, um, getting involved locally, uh, you know, at my university with outreach programs. Um, but when the COVID pandemic started, uh, you know, there was obviously a big shift in how we were interacting with each other and how we were delivering um, scientific information. And uh, uh, TikTok was started around that time, or at least gained popularity during that time. And I myself, uh, you know, use these platforms mostly just for entertainment for a long time. Uh, until I, I discovered, I kind of stumbled upon this, this niche sub area within social media of science communication and, and social media being used specifically 
to deliver information about science to a wide audience. Uh, and so I just sort of decided to, to give it a try, um, sort of on a whim, not really expecting anything from it. Uh, and it was very successful. I uploaded a TikTok video, which did very well. Of course, once you upload a video, you get a lot of questions and that kind of feeds new videos and, and it sort of snowballed from there. Um, so yeah, so that's how I got started. I, I already had an interest in getting the word out there about science and astrobiology in particular, and social media was a really good and effective way to do that. Um, and it was it was very successful. It's given me a lot of opportunities I otherwise would not have had. Um, I think it's strengthened my skills as a science communicator and also just a scientist in general. Um, and yeah, right now it's working out pretty well. I've taken a little bit of a break just because that work is sort of, I considered my side job. My main job is to be a research scientist. And so um, when I took this new position as a postdoc, I sort of decided to prioritize that for a little bit. And so now I sort of dabble in it a little bit, but not uh, as consistently as I did before. So, yeah. Right, right. You yeah, quite quite the journey. Um, and I think you've taken us through your your postings through the journey and the video you shared today too, right? Like what does your day-to-day -day look like? Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people that's inspiring, well, what would it look like for me to work in a lab every day uh, in, in your domain? Um, so Elena from Canada asks, what topics do you expect to be big within astrobiology in the next uh, next year, in 2024? And maybe if you want to paint a five-year horizon, that could yeah. be interesting too. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, just looking at the sort of the, the plan for the next few years. Um, obviously, we can sort of guess a lot based on the missions that are currently active or that are coming up. Um, the JWST um, is doing a lot of work on exoplanets, so planets that are outside the solar system and trying to look at their atmospheres and what those atmospheres are made of, if they have any atmospheres. It's a big question that JWST is also helping to answer is, do planets beyond the solar system that look like Earth kind of have atmospheres? We don't know that. Um, so uh, in doing that, I think it's going to set the stage for a lot more inquiry about what other planetary systems are like and how much work we can actually do in a laboratory setting to answer some questions, to follow up question. You know, so can we simulate some of those atmospheric conditions here on Earth? Um, and what does that tell us about what the planetary environment might be like underneath that atmosphere? Um, so I think that's going to continue to be a big area as JWST continues to do some of these observations and we get more and more atmospheric data is sort of asking astrobiology questions about these extrasolar worlds. So I think that's going to be a big topic for the year, continuing this year and next year. Yeah. Obviously, Clipper, which I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll have to wait a little bit longer for that. Um, it will it won't arrive at its destination until 2030. So, um, but you know, once 2030 comes around and that mission is there, uh, there's also another mission that will be arriving around the same time at its destination called Dragonfly. Um, Dragonfly will go to another really interesting moon called Titan. That's another one of Enceladus's moons, or sorry, Saturn's moons. So Enceladus and Titan are both moons of Saturn. Uh, Titan is a super interesting world. Uh, we've only been there once with uh, Cassini Huygens. Uh, the little we know about it is tells us that it's a very, very interesting world. It's very different from Earth. It's also very different from Enceladus and Europa. Uh, so Dragonfly will get there in the early 2030s as well. So early 2030s will be very exciting in terms of outer solar system science. We'll be getting images from that. We'll be learning a ton about these worlds. Uh, closer to home, I think we're just going to continue to learn more about, you know, weird life. So, you know, we keep discovering microbes and, and weird organisms that exist in more and more extreme conditions. I think that's going to continue to surprise us over the next few years. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I'm looking at on the horizon right now. Oh, yeah, very exciting things happening. Yep. Um, yeah, any further questions on, on that from folks? All right, so I have many, many other questions. Um, I mean, great response. I'm, you know, really excited. Jim Webb is now bringing all this data. Just basing on that, though, I see our cohort is, is fairly young. A lot of uh, goes from high schools to about, um, yeah, actually goes from high school to some undergraduate students, master's students, PhDs. And then we have a lot of people working in the field, too. And one of my questions, oops, uh, yeah. Uh, one of my questions was, you mentioned all this data that's being collected. Right now, I see that a lot of that data is, you know, you have to be at NASA, you have to be at a university to start digging into it. Are there any kind of private sector initiatives as well that uh, are looking at this research and looking at astrobiology beyond yeah. the government institutions? 
So a really important thing to note, um, so that is definitely true about um, some data, right? So some data is, is controlled in terms of its dissemination and really the only way to access it is once it's been published, right? Once it's gone through the peer review process, uh, once it's been reviewed internally. Uh, but it's also really important to mention that a lot of these big data sets, like the ones produced by JWST are publicly available. So that is that is completely public. So. If you, uh, you know, are inclined and you you know how to handle large data sets and you have interesting questions you want to try to answer yourself, you are free to do that in principle. So that's very important to note. That's true for all NASA missions as well. So all those data publicly available. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, and that's, I think that's really cool. I think, um, you know, opening that up to pretty much anybody is including people who aren't directly involved on the mission or even at NASA in general it's super great. It's very important. It's a, a very important part of, of the process and how we make progress, um, not just in this field, but in, in any field. Um, so yeah, but at least in terms of some of the more basic fundamental data. So, you know, the kind of work that I'm doing that is not associated with a particular mission, um, that the, to get access to those data, you'll probably have to wait until it's, it's published. So, right. right. Yeah. But, but you mentioned data, and along with data comes the tools to analyze them. So Dr. J. Pinto, he asks, have you ever used a quantum computer in your experiments? How does AI affect or benefit some of the work you're doing as well? And he mentions that he was at JPL twice last month. So I'm curious there as well, what are some new analytical tools you're seeing? Because the data you collect is very, very large data, and it requires large kind of computation methodologies. Yeah. yeah, so I have not used a quantum computer. I would love to, that'd be super fun, but I haven't had uh, the need or the opportunity to do that in any of my research so far, actually. Um, so, uh, okay, so that's one answer. Um, in terms of other tools, um, things like AI. So uh, I, you know, I think that the AI will have, uh, it already does have, but will will continue to have a significant impact on all areas of research, but also astrobiology. Um, in my work, um, the, the way I'll answer the question right now about my work is, uh, even though I'm doing a lot of experiments, the data set that I'm generating is actually quite small. When we think of sort of the spectrum of like big data, um, I'm, I'm tiny data, right? Like I'm doing manual experiments. Um, when I look at a microscope, I'm counting spores manually, right? So everything there, um, you know, if things are small enough and packaged enough that uh, it's on the scale of what, of what a human can handle, and we prefer to have a human handle anyway. Uh, so, but at least in terms of, you know, when we start getting into questions like, um, you know, do we need to carry out these experiments under, you know, different combinations of conditions and, and you know, we start, we start really increasing the volume, um, then I think AI, um, and other tools might become useful, um, not just in kind of designing experiments, you know, so what combinations do we want to study? What's the optimal thing? Um, but also like how we make sense of those data. So, yeah. Um, certainly opportunities to do that right now, like I said, I'm, I'm in the tiny data sector, so I don't really need those tools. Um, I think there could be other ways in which AI help. Um, you know, we, we in our lab have sort of been guilty of experimenting with chat GPT and things like that, you know, asking it questions that just, just mostly out of curiosity at this point, more than actual need. <laughs> right. Um, but Within yeah. my own office, we made a little chat GPT version, but it, we feed it the data we want. And it's meant for researchers, like it's with the research at the back end, so you can easily answer questions uh, cool. or ask, ask questions and have them answered. Uh, but maybe for everyone here, this could be a fun Vermillion project, like because I know many of you are coming from a quantum project, many of you are biologists, a lot of you have great computational background. Maybe this is an opportunity to piece together a good astrobiology plus uh, new computational methodology project. So how to use AI and astro? Yeah. Yeah, and I would definitely point you to uh, some of the big data sets that are available. Um, you know, not just JWST, especially for if you know if people are interested in exoplanets, which is mostly where the astrobiology science comes from, just because JWST does a lot um, that's non-astrobiology related as well. Um, but there are also other telescopes as well where the, the data are you know massive and, and and astrobiology relevant. So I would point you to some of the other exoplanet telescopes like Kepler and TESS. Those are two big ones. Yes. Um, so just in case that's of interest. <laughs> yes, of course. Okay, I'm so excited. We're going to make a project out of this. Um, all right, so I see we have a few minutes and a lot more questions. So Oscar from the Netherlands asks, uh, do you consider the influence of magnetic field differences in other experiments with these microbes in your studies? Yeah, so indirectly, yes. Um, right now, we aren't including any kind of magnetic field component in our experiments, but we are sort of operating under the assumption that 
Well, okay, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So uh, Europa, we know, does not have it, its own magnetic field, but it has an induced magnetic field from Jupiter. Jupiter is a massive mag magnetic field. It's just a beast. Um, it has these, these magnetic field rings around it. Um, and one of the consequences of the, those magnetic field rings is that it's basically bombarding um, its moons with high energy particles that get trapped in those magnetic field lines and then sort of bombarded on the surface of, of these moons. Um, so that is exactly what we were trying to study in, in our laboratory, at least when it comes to Europa, is how do those high energy particles influence our ability to detect biosignatures, for example. So in an indirect way, we are sort of dealing with this magnetic field component because of this induced magnetic field, but not because we're recreating that aspect directly. Um, we are just kind of studying the consequences of that, which is this strong ionizing radiation. Um, that's not so much the case with Enceladus because it's further out. Um, Saturn does not have as big of an induced magnetic field. It's not showering uh, Enceladus with these high energy particles the same way Europa is. Um, so. Yeah, so indirectly, yes, not directly. It would be really cool, but um, that's not something we're currently doing. All right. Wow, exciting. Um, do you use fluorescence microscopy for cell imaging? We don't currently, but that would be very cool. Um, it'd be very cool to see whether or not, you know, um, cells have the ability to continue fluorescing, right? So some, some of them auto fluoresce, right? You don't need to do anything to them. They'll, they'll have a fluorescent signal. Um, some of the molecules in there, like things like ring structures automatically fluoresce. It'd be really cool to see if radiation has changed that in some way. Um, it'd also be cool to see if like the the chemistry that ensues, right? So when you take a, a mo biological molecule and you expose it to radiation, that radiation not just destroys it, but it also causes chemistry to happen. Um, so things will react together and new structures will form. Sometimes some of those structures might fluoresce because of their new structures. So it'd be really cool just to study in general how fluorescence changes in these irradiated samples. That's not something we're currently doing now, um, but we're using Raman fluorescence, which is a little bit, it's, it's similar, but um, it, it's not, it's a little bit different than fluorescence microscopy. Um, it's actually mm -hmm. looking at the spectrum um, and not uh, ne necessarily generating an image at this point. Right, right, correct. And we'll have, we should have a talk on Raman spectroscopy sometime. So that was Aditi from Finland. Mm -hmm. uh, Neeti asked from India, and her question is, what are your views on bio uh, diagnostic uh, biosignatures, especially in environments that like Titan has or hydrocarbon bases like ethane and methane? Yeah. So I think in general, biosignatures is very tricky right now um, because we actually don't really have a ton of biosignatures. As I would say right now, we really don't have any conclusive biosignatures in that, you know, they can't be explained by any other process. So the, the, the science on diagnostic biosignatures is very shaky right now. Um, it's, it's too early to tell. Um, every time we think we found something that is biological, we find another explanation that most likely explains the pattern or phenomenon that we're seeing. Uh, you know, we've seen that on Mars. Um, we will probably see that on Titan as well and these other worlds that we'll explore. So yeah, diagnostic biosignatures, I would say right now is inconclusive. Um, and that's not just my opinion, that's just a, a, a recap of the, of the field as it stands right now. Um, so we really don't have good smoking gun biosignatures for life. And that's really interesting when you think about it, right? Like we, we know biology pretty well. Of course, there are a lot of things we still don't know, but we largely know what biology is made of um, and what its constituents parts are. And the fact that we don't have good biosignatures for that right now is, is sort of telling. Uh, you know, it's, imagine if we start thinking about forms of life that might be very different from our own, that might be silicon based, right? That makes things more challenging. Um, so yeah, so that's my general opinion right now is we don't have good diagnostic biosignatures. <laughs> right, yeah, very interesting. Um, all right, so Uma from India S. So you were talking about analysis before and does that analysis also include gene expression studies? And then if so, what extent have these IC moons conditions affected by the micro, microbes genome? And how could the uh, inference from this be employed in studying the phylogeny of extra extremophiles on Earth? Yeah, good question. So, um, so we don't do any gene expression studies in our research right now. It's not part of our analytical pipeline, mostly because we're interested in, um, you know, looking at the material itself and seeing how persistent it is or how, how it resists radiation 
degradation by radiation and therefore what can be detected or not. And we're not as interested in sort of the physiological responses that the, that the bacteria have to radiation. Now, I should mention, there have been a lot of studies, a lot of work has been done on B sub and other microorganisms on their kind of gene expression response to some of these conditions, maybe not all together, but at least in isolation. So, you know, how they respond to radiation, what is kind of the gene expression cascade there in response to cold, things like that. Um, but in our laboratory, we're less interested in that. Uh, the, the, more, the most we study with DNA is actually the DNA itself and its integrity and how damaged it's been. So we study double strand breaks, you know, so if, if the DNA has been broken by one of these radiation sources, we have ways of studying that, and that is of interest to us. Um, but yeah, but we're less inter interested at the gene level at this point. That's very interesting. And then I have a lot of questions of people asking for advice on, uh, uh, on you know, coming from a medical biology field who wants to get into astrobiology. Uh, tell us, I mean, you shared with us your journey, but maybe you have some advice for people wanting to join the field. Yeah. So there are, I think, two ways to think about it. One is, you know, that uh, medical biology is actually has quite a bit of relevance to astrobiology in the sense that astrobiology is also interested in sort of the future of life in space. And that includes humanity's sort of increasing relationship with space and going out into space um, and understanding how space environments affect human physiology uh, is a big part of astrobiology. And I feel like having a medical background uh, sort of sets you up to do some of that work and answer some of those questions. So that's one way to potentially think about, you know, if you wanna adapt your background, your, your expertise to something kind of new, to ask new questions, that's one avenue. And it's very relevant to astrobiology and it's gonna to continue to be, let's say that's pretty, probably gonna be a pretty hot area, especially as the Artemis programs continue to unfold and we start having human presences on the moon, right? There'll be opportunities there. So think about that. Um, that's a little bit of a long-term thing, but just, you know, that the, there will continue to be a need to understand how human physiology uh, responds to space environments. Um, the other is to think about, you know, um, the fact that having any kind of scientific training at all, which most medical students have to have, right, even if they're not doing research, um, you have had to take a science curriculum. Um, hopefully where you are academically uh, or will be academically has the opportunity to do research. Um, and I think that's the number one way right now to do astrobiology. We don't have, there's not a huge um, opportunity in the private sector to do astrobiology. Um, right now it's, it's, it's sort of a basic science venture. And so the main way to do that is to get involved in academic research or eventually in, in government research, right? Working with NASA. Uh, so if, you, if there's a way for you to become involved in research, even if it doesn't necessarily have to be an astrobiology lab, because there aren't a ton of those of self-proclaimed or self-titled Astrobiology labs, that will be beneficial because um, astrobiology is very interdis interdisciplinary. So sort of any skills you gain in research can be adapted. Um, you know, if you decide to go to grad school or join a laboratory that does astrobiology research. So kind of those are two things to consider. Right. Well, I think that question itself is a testament that you really inspired us. We all want to become future yeah. astrobiologists. biologists. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Lena. I think unless there are any last questions, but, um, you know, Lena, thank you for showing us your lab, the equipment you use as well, the SEA machine, what the kind of spores you're looking at, the kind of data you handle with, handle with, and also your journey and how you're now, now inspiring more and more people uh, and educating them about this field, but really inspiring them to ask more questions, be scientifically, scientifically curious, and possibly join the astrobiology field as well. So again, thank you very much. You've been great. And I think there are already some projects here. We have data from James Webb. We, we look to apply AI too. We have other sort of projects. So looking forward to staying in touch and, uh, and doing good things together. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Lena. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, just some quick quick uh, announcements that you guys may have missed before. Uh, flash talks, we'll do flash talks again next week, but we loved hearing them. I know many of you do are doing really cool work or you're thinking about interesting things. So share that with us, go to Canvas, sign up for a flash talk and we'll have you lined up for next week. Uh, then the quiz, quiz for uh, Dr. Williams talk, that is due this Sunday. And then teams, many of you had questions, well, can I change my teams or something happened with the team structure? So Tess has spent a lot of time to go through each of the questions. And on Canvas, she's made a form submission, again, based on the issue you're having. Uh, she's figured out a process where you can update all the information, again, based on the modification you need. 
And then lastly, in a few days, we'll have a mission checkpoint. So I really hope with like hearing how, how Lena thinks about some of her work. Last week, you also heard uh, Amy Williams, Joseph Marlin, again, planning missions. I hope you have an idea of how do you go about planning missions. And then we'll have a, a, it's a checkpoint, right? It's a milestone. And this is our way to make sure you're on the right path, give you support and feedback until the end of the project. Um, so make, make sure you get to a good end of the project. So that is due September 1st in a few days. So good luck. And uh, yeah, I think with that, we can call it a day. Thank you all. This has been great to host you. Bye-bye.